Hello and welcome to the Currency Exchange, NatWest Markets FX podcast, where we help to break down the major themes and events driving currency markets this week and in the weeks ahead. Today I'm joined by our two co-heads of G10FX, Paul Robson and Brian Dangerfield, and we will be um, dissecting the main movers in G10FX today. Ryan, I'm going to start with you. The USD has weakened sharply over the past month. What exactly is the main drivers behind this big currency move? Well, thanks for having me, Imar. I think, you know, we think about the drivers of the dollar on the top side that have really been the themes of this podcast really over the last couple of months. Since the middle of the summer, the dollar has been on a pretty torrid rise really through the end of October with a number of different drivers that we've been talking about here. One of the big ones is U.S. data continuing to perform at pace. You had uh, economic data, including employment and inflation, continuing to surprise to the top side. Uh, Consumer spending also remained extremely strong throughout the third quarter. You actually had a GDP of over 5% annualized in the third quarter. And the data, the monthly data we were getting building into that report over the third quarter was pretty consistently stronger than expected. So the data in the U.S. was very strong, while data elsewhere in the world uh, was showing signs of weakening further. Um, And so that data really sort of fueled this idea of dollar exceptionalism uh, 2.0, sort of revival of dollar exceptionalism. At the same time as the Fed was, you know, as the data was forcing the market to take on a more aggressive Fed path, a more hawkish Fed path, global rates and U.S. rates in particular were rising, particularly in the long end. Um, And that was also putting pressure on uh, cyclically sensitive currencies uh, and currencies where, you know, interest rate differentials are making a big, uh, uh, big difference, such as in emerging markets. And so interest rate moves and the economic data fueling those interest rate moves were big drivers of the dollar on the top side really through the end of October. And so I think it's important to have that context as we think about why the dollar has weakened throughout the month of November. And it's really been a bit of a relaxation of a number of these uh, these themes. The first one being the economic data in the U.S. coming in a little bit softer than expectations on some key releases, talking specifically about non-farm payrolls early in November and then later Uh, the CPI and PPI coming in soft and expected as well. In both cases, you're not talking about massive downside misses, but against the backdrop that we were coming from, uh, even a small miss can have a pretty big impact on the way that uh, on the way that the market is looking at the the scale of dollar exceptionalism. One of the things we talked about in our year ahead podcast is we wondered if the scale of dollar exceptionalism was probably past its peak and some of the data at least lean into that a little bit. The other thing that you have seen is the Fed's tone has shifted, and that's helped rates to recover from their losses. In this case, yields lower, prices higher for U.S. sovereign debt. Um, One of the big drivers of that is the Fed has really internalized these changes in market conditions into their thinking. So when rates were rising, especially in the long end, that has led the Fed to say, hey, maybe the market's doing some of this work for us, that higher rates in the long end allow the Fed at their November meeting to take a bit more comfort in a more uh, in a more cautious and dovish path going forward, they seem a bit more confident now, especially after some of the data that we've had in the month of November, uh, that they may be in for a more prolonged pause. And so the market has taken that as a sign that maybe we really are at the peak in terms of rates, and interest rates have fallen in some cases quite significantly. So you have uh, thirty-year yields um, have fallen around fifty basis points uh, over the course of this month. So you've seen, I think, a relaxation of some of the big dollar drivers to the top side over the last couple of weeks with the biggest changes being what we've heard from the Fed, how they're internalizing financial conditions uh, into their thinking, giving the market a bit more confidence that maybe the peak is in in rates. Um, And also from the data side that because data had been so strongly outperforming, even a small change in the data, a small uh, miss in the data relative to expectations uh, could have a big impact. It's important also to think about um, seasonal factors and positioning as we head into this seasonally uh, less liquid period, as we're heading into the holiday period now, uh, positioning in the dollar over the last couple of months as the data were outperforming, as the dollar was rallying, we think dollar long positioning was getting, uh, you know, it was starting to move uh, quite a bit more positive. If you look at CFTC futures positioning data, for example, that suggested that uh, dollar positioning had flipped from net short in the summer to uh, pretty meaningful net longs. So positioning probably uh, enhances the weakness that we've seen recently. The fact that the data is all the data and rates were all pushing in one direction, and the consensus was all there as well. So small changes when positioning is one way can certainly lead to uh, larger changes 
um, in currencies when you know when, when all of those one-way positions uh, s s suddenly head to the sidelines. Another one is seasonal factors to consider. We are heading into a seasonally weak period for the dollar. December does, on average, tend to be the worst month of the year uh, for the U.S. dollar. It tends to be a pretty positive uh, period for risk assets in general. So that's something that the market may be looking at as well, that some of the data came in a bit softer, but we're also heading into a period where the dollar does tend to weaken. And so you know, if the market was very long of dollars heading into November, a couple of data points missed the mark just slightly, and that led markets to maybe pull back on that enthusiasm for dollar exceptionalism. And the timing of seasonal patterns, you know, maybe markets looking ahead to December and saying, hey, this is normally a time when the dollar weakens. And so maybe that adds a bit of extra emphasis to come to the sidelines here uh, and take some of those dollar longs off the table. I think that's been that's sort of enhancing this move that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. I really want to zone in on that growth factor because, yes, U.S. data has moderated, but not in a vacuum. Growth elsewhere isn't looking particularly strong. You know, how is this kind of relative growth dynamic really feeding into your dollar view? Yeah, it, it's important that you brought that up because I think the relative growth picture, it's not just about absolute growth. It's not just about what's happening in the U.S. Relative growth is very important. And for those who listen to our Year Ahead podcast um, from a couple of weeks ago and have read our Year Ahead Outlook, um, you'll know that our view for the dollar has been a bit more balanced and, in fact, a little bit leading positive as we head into the end of the year and into the first quarter of next year. With our thinking here being that the rate story, the lower rate story that we've been seeing appears to be materializing a lot faster than we expected. Um, and it, frankly, it feels like it's materialized maybe a bit too fast. The data in the U.S., as you mentioned, have moderated a little bit, but the data have still been pretty strong, um, all things considered. And they're certainly stronger than what we're seeing from most other major economies. You still have challenges in Europe, something I'm sure Paul will touch on. Um, and the data in China have only just modestly bounced back after some very, very strong stimulus there. And so from a relative growth perspective, um, we don't think that conditions are particularly conducive to outperformance in currencies, you know, in cyclically linked currencies and weaker growth on balance tends to be positive um, for the dollar. And so I think what you're seeing over the last couple of weeks has been dollar positioning really enhancing the move to the downside. Same in the rates market, right? Interest rates were in a are sort of a one-way train higher in the U.S. for a long time. I think there was some real skepticism of trying to buy the dip, trying to get in the way of that constant downside. And now that you've seen a reversal, there's been a clear, you know, there's been a clear change in mentality on the rate side, uh, just off of a couple of a uh, couple of data points which came in slightly better than expected. So that I think brings with it the question of whether or not this move is maybe a bit overextended. Um, that the gains that we have seen have come a bit too far too fast. We actually don't think the Fed easing cycle really starts until uh, until May of next year. So the fact that you've had such a big rates move on the back of just a couple of small pieces of data is something that we should maybe be looking at a bit skeptically, especially since the, uh, the, the broader data, the broader global growth outlook is probably still slowing. The last time we had a big thematic weakening of the dollar, uh, was really in this point last year. You talk about from the November to January period um, of November 2022 into January 2023. What you had at that time was not just a changing of the market expectations around the Fed, but you also had significant changes in the market's perception of growth outside of the U.S. Remember, at that time, you had expectations for European growth were very, very depressed because of fears about European energy and China growth expectations really hadn't shifted because they hadn't escaped, you know, they hadn't left zero COVID yet. So at that time, when in November into January of last year, the last time we had a big thematic weakening in the dollar, you didn't just have moderation in U.S. data and change in the Fed. You also had a big upward revision to global growth expectations, helping add to that sense of dollar weakness. In this case, what we've seen currently, I think you have the former, where certainly the market is more confident that the Fed, the peak in the Fed hawkishness is behind us, but I just don't think you have that latter yet. And so I think that global growth picture probably still merits some caution. We're certainly heading into a weak seasonal period for the dollar. So can this extend? If the data allow it to, if the data in the US uh, come in a little bit weaker as we come up, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Brian. I guess, you know, currency markets have felt like they've been such a dollar story recently. Um, but actually in Europe, a lot has been happening in terms of the data prints, but also central bank. 
Well, I want to bring you in at this point because um, perhaps we can start with the UK and the Bank of England. It certainly feels that the bank is really pushing back against market expectations for the future rate path. I guess the big question is, you know, is it working? Um, and what does that mean for sterling? Yeah, it does certainly seem to be uh, working. Sterling has actually been uh, outperforming over the last uh, couple of weeks. But I think it's quite interesting to see that in the sort of broader picture for Europe, because we are already getting quite a lot of divergence in terms of the inflation trends, growth, and crucially how central banks uh, react to that. And, and we think uh, as a team that that's going to be fundamentally important to how people should see European currencies throughout 2024, I, I think we're going to see some surprising, uh, the large moves actually in European currencies. And I think as central banks transition from this global tightening cycle to an easing cycle uh, via a plateau in rates of some yet to be determined uh, length, that that's going to cause quite a lot of differentiation. Uh, in currencies. Uh, in terms of the Bank of England, as, exactly as you said, there seems to have been quite a comprehensive and aggressive, coordinated even pushback on the pricing in of early uh, rate cuts from the, the Bank of England. It really does feel like uh, the Bank of England isn't contemplating how to get down off Table Mountain for some time. And, and to be fair, quite a lot of other central banks are doing the same because they understand that once they call time on fighting inflation, markets will start to price in a series of uh, rate cuts uh, and potentially unwind all the good work that they've done. So they just want to make sure that um, markets aren't too quick to price in rate cuts. But I think for the Bank of England, that pushback is just a little bit more uh, believable uh, because of the supply side impact on the economy of uh, various events over the last uh, couple of years. We've got the UK economy, which is more service-based uh, dominant and uh, unlike energy and food prices that can get cheaper over time, humans don't get cheaper over time. So you get a little bit more persistence uh, in inflation, which is what the central bank is trying to um, sort of uh, achieve in this uh, tightening of monetary policy. And also there's a delay in the monetary policy transmission mechanism in the UK because of fixed rate mortgages. It just takes time for that monetary policy tightening that we've seen to exert uh, on the economy. And again, the central bank wants to make sure that uh, inflation's coming down uh, before calling time on it. Uh, in terms of uh, sterling, I would just simply make the point that over the last 18 months, sterling against both the euro and the dollar continues to track nominal rate uh, expectations. And if we're right that the Bank of England keeps rates higher for longer, uh, when the ECB and the, the Fed are cutting rates and maybe some other central banks, uh, then it feels like sterling could challenge a really quite a bearish market consensus for sterling. So sterling uh, outperformance that it's been uh, achieving over the last couple of weeks, we think continues into to next year. And that's a, a very much a go with uh, theme for markets. Yeah, I guess that key kind of um, narrative of relative central bank policy is still so much in play. I have to draw you on some very interesting um, data prints that we've had out of the Eurozone, particularly uh, these national and obviously the Eurozone aggregate CPI. What do you make of the um, figures? And I guess, what does it mean for the Euro? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to see how these data could have been uh, any weaker than they actually were. I mean, they were uh, below consensus. They were below what the ECB is expecting. And it was broad-based weakness in inflation pressures. And when we think about that sort of metaphor of um, table mountain in terms of central banks transitioning from that tightening to an easing cycle, then the fact that inflation is coming down more quickly than the central bank and markets expected is, is clearly uh, important for where the euro uh, goes. And at this point, the ECB's forecast for both growth and inflation look just far too high. And they'll be updating those projections come the December uh, ECB policy uh, meeting. And, you know, while forecasting economic data is a bit of a sort of dark art, you can get numbers to show exactly what you want, what the kind of guidance you want to give to the market about rate increases. But even if they 
you know, don't lower their inflation forecasts and growth numbers uh, enough, it, you bring into question the credibility of those forecasts and markets just don't believe them. Uh, and we think that that weakness in inflation just means the central bank is closer to that first all important rate uh, cut uh, early next year. We think that ultimately uh, weighs on the, the currency. Uh, so when we think about the outlook for both euro dollar, so touching on things that Brian has talked about in terms of the, the Fed, um, we don't think that euro dollar uh, goes up in a straight line here. And I actually think that we could go lower at the beginning of next year as the ECB uh, loosens policy ahead, uh, you know, at the vanguard of that global policy easing. And the euro sterling also comes lower as the, the Bank of England uh, delays that first rate cut all the way through into uh, Q3. So it feels like Europe is very much front and center of this uh, transition in monetary policy, and that could potentially bring quite large currency moves. Yeah, I particularly was really surprised by Italy headline CPI and 0.7 percent. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear uh, where monetary policy divergence is heading. Guys, that's probably about all we have time for this week. Brian and Paul, thank you so much for joining me as always. Um, guys, if you did like the podcast, please do click like and remember to subscribe so you get the latest episode first. Thanks again.